I'm Kathy Stewart. I'm part of the Novelis team, and at Novelis, of course, we're all about matching readers with books and hopefully finding ways to make that easier for you. We have an umbrella term that we call story elements, and that's a term that identifies a variety of book components, things like subject headings, appeals, and now the latest, themes. And it shows how they fit together and how you can put those into use. So we're going to talk today about themes, those popular and recurring plot elements that are found in fiction, and help you see how they make a great way to talk with your patrons, regardless of whether you have novelists at your library or not. So lucky for you, we've got two great panelists to help you take a closer look on how to use themes as a stealth weapon in your readers' advisory conversations. Let me introduce them. First, Becky Spratford is a reader's advisor working in Illinois. And among her many talents, I'll just hit the highlights here, she specializes in serving teens and adults and trains library staff worldwide on matching readers with books. She's also on the steering committee of the Adult Reading Roundtable. She's known for her book, The Reader's Advisory Guide to Horror. And she's also a proud member of the Horror Writers Association. So check her out on her training blog, RA for All, and follow her on Twitter, Twitter handle, at RA for All. Kathleen Kaiser is our metadata strategy manager here at Novelist. She feeds a team of metadata librarians whose work includes responding to trends in the publishing industry. They then assess and redefine the taxonomies in Novelist to make sure to create clear access points and targeted reading recommendations in Novelist for readers. In her spare time, Kathleen likes to read true crime, gossipy memoirs, and scary stories, especially ones about vengeful ghosts and bloodthirsty killers. So Kathleen's going to kick us off today by talking about how themes have become an integral part of Novelist story elements. Kathleen? Thanks, Kathy, and thank you, Becky, and thanks to everyone who's coming online to, for this webinar. As you know, I come from the metadata side of the house, so I'm super excited to be talking with you about metadata and RA. Now, to get us all grounded and started, let's talk about what themes are. Well, themes, which can also be referred to as tropes, are recurring plot lines, topics, or characters that are commonly found in different genres or areas. These themes are so popular and well-known and recognizable mainly because they happen just over and over and over again. And that theme itself, its wording, can become part of that lexicon for that genre. And that is the part of the beauty of themes. They can quickly convey one of the main parts of the book. For example, knowing that a book is about a fish out of water, it gives you a good idea of what the book is about kind of gives you a sneak peek of what to expect, kind of like a shorthand. So let me talk about how I came to themes from my own personal reading experience. So one of my favorite books of all time is Jaws. Uh, if you haven't read the book, maybe you've seen the movie, and if not, um, quick summary, it's about a small New England beach community that has to deal with this man-eating shark who just happens to be hanging out for the summer. Now, I love this book, and one of the major parts that I love it for is this evil animal aspect. What I really like is that juxtaposition of man's best friend becoming man's blood-hungry casual acquaintance, this whole human versus nature motif. So when it comes to finding that in other books, I was having a really hard time using subject and genre headings to find. Take a look at what headings this does have on it. Now, looking at these headings, they're all great. They really do a good job of describing the book, and they all fit what is in the book. But what's missing is this, there's not anything that gets at that concept of an evil animal or evil nature, and there isn't even a way that I could mix and match these headings to find more. I mean, I'm down with killer horses and killer crocs, but like I'm never going to get there using these headings. So for me as a reader, it was really frustrating. Let's take a look um, at another example on the title we probably all know about. Yep, The Martian. I bet there's a handful out there thinking I was going to pick Gone Girl, right? Well, back to The Martian. If you haven't read or seen this movie, um, you might have a good idea what it's about. 
This guy gets left behind on Mars all alone. He gets a little emo about it. And thanks to potatoes and some snarky commentary, he gets rescued. So he's basically lost in space, right? That's a good example of a theme. Let's take a look at the headings that we used to describe this book. So yeah, again, great job on these headings. They are true for the book. They fit very well. But again, there really isn't anything that hits on lost in space. There really isn't a way to get at that major plot point. So what are we getting at? As you can see, at just the couple of books we've looked at, while these things are hitting on a lot of the same elements and characteristics of these books, but they're not getting at that central part of the story, that gist of the book. You know, that quick conversation you have with friends when talking about what book you're reading. And that's what themes are. You know, as I mentioned earlier, themes are so well known that even just the phrase of it gives you an idea of what it's about. Uh, I'm apologizing for some of the animation. It's not going as effective. We're just going to roll with it. Now, you can see all these different themes that's listed up here. We all probably have a good idea of what they refer to, and not just because we're all librarians here in a webinar about RA, but because it's that phrase itself. It's how people, how readers talk about that kind of story. And it's also important um, because many readers use these to find books that they really want to read, but also how to avoid books they hate. So for me personally, I love a good revenge story, but I am really so over zombies right now. I would like to mention that there are character tropes as well, and even though it looks like a lot of the ones we saw earlier were plot driven, so they can be ones that you kind of know what they are, like a dark lord or a wolf in sheep's clothing or Women of Steel, Warrior Women are other examples. Now, a lot of these do sound like subject headings, and many are, but they can be a little misleading or confusing when used in that traditional subject heading way. So let me show you an example. So friendship. Uh, it's super common subject heading on lots of titles. Most of these are in children's materials, like picture books, easy readers, and whatnot. That being said, having it on title can be misleading. So let's look at some titles. There is a big difference between a story that has friendship or friends on it versus one that is about making friends. So here are two books that both have that subject heading, and it does fit both books. But it really doesn't get at the main point of both of these books. I mean, Elephant and Piggy, they go way back super tight, but this book isn't really about their friendship journey. It's more about patience. So when thinking of themes, it gives more weight to what the book is. And so you have a stronger idea of what this book is about. So more importantly, you know who would be looking for this book. Another thing about themes and subject headings in the themes, they can be broader and have a larger reach. So in metadata, when we're cataloging, we love getting the specifics because that's where you can really help someone with subject searching. So if somebody is looking for a book about fear of dentists, they have a way to get at that book. But when you have this kind of specificity, it can make things more complicated for searching, actually. While a basic search for fear would probably bring up all of these subjects since they all have that word fear in them, there are just so many to start looking at, and this can be very overwhelming very early for somebody using a catalog, which is why when ideas are taken from subject headings and developed into a theme, it can bring all of them under a broader heading. So almost bringing them under a kind of a theme umbrella and so that way you can create a go-between between your collection and the reader. Here in this example, these are a lot of related subject headings that can be covered by the theme getting along with others. Many of these headings, yeah, they're pretty straightforward, um, but a couple of them are a little unclear. I mean, do you think all the users of your catalog know the difference between fighting, feuds, bickering, and quarreling? With terms like this, 
you're requiring the user to know and to use your vocabulary. So you're putting up a barrier between the collection and the catalog users. And so what themes can do is bridge that gap between how the catalog or library talks about books and how readers talk about books. So I've been talking about themes and why they're important. And throughout this, I've been peppering in here and there some of the themes that we worked and created here in-house at Novelist. We've been working on creating themes and tropes vocabulary for about two years now, and we've created 250 so far, about on 50,000 titles. So it's quite a bit of work. So you're probably, hopefully, wondering how we did it. Well, when we started this project, one of, we really wanted to focus on staying true to how our readers, how fans talk about themes and tropes because our goal here is to talk directly to the reader, not necessarily any metadata or subject heading junkies. We did a significant amount of research, paying specific attention to the fan sites, social media, Goodreads, you know, really just looking for anywhere people are talking about books. We are also extremely fortunate that we have a couple genre experts here on staff. Quite a few people here have been on book award committees, and we also have some who have written materials on Reader's Advisory for ALA. So we had a couple people in-house to turn to for help. Once we developed themes in an area, we would stop to make sure that we were going in the right direction by taking a moment to look at what was out there, what was being said in the media, on book sites, and just to make sure that we were pointed in the right direction. So as we got started, and so to not be so overwhelming, we focused on one genre at a time so we could just work it really hard and then take some steps back, reflect on what we did and how it worked, and then take any lessons and put it towards the next area. When deciding on which areas to work on, we wanted to be very thoughtful. Some genres uh, focus very heavily on themes and tropes, so like romance or science fiction. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't just work on those areas. In a lot of ways, themes are like appeal and subject terms. They can be found in lots of different areas and lots of different genres. We also wanted to make an impact on as much of our collection as we could. So we decided to focus on the areas that are the most circulating, as you can see here from a report by a library journal. In each area, we did research really working on the popular phrases that fans use in that area. And then with each genre, we did pay special attention to the various subgenres that are within the collection, which involves researching chick lit, Christian mysteries, epic fantasy, and countless other subgenres. With figuring out which individual books to look at, there we had to make some other choices. Novels has a collection of almost half a million titles. So that way we can support any type of school or public library collection. So what we did is to make priorities, we decided to focus mainly on award-winning or very popular titles. So on top of this, we also wanted to work on genres that can be a little challenging for some librarians. So we focused on ones that we have consistently um, have gotten asked for training materials on here at Novelist. So genres like horror and urban fiction. And throughout this whole project, we didn't want to just focus on adults. As we worked through these things, uh, we did include all audience levels in, in these genres. And as you can see, a couple here that were solely in um, genre areas on lower on the juvenile audience. But we also looked at titles that were more like picture books, easy readers, younger kid books that don't really fit inside another genre. So we're paying special attention to those areas. All in all, it took about two years, but projects like this never do die. Um, just by the nature of how we work here at Novelist, we're always seeing new titles that are coming in. And some of those do prompt us to create new themes, like for example, um, this past week, we are working out the details for a new theme, uh, which will most likely be found in romance and general fiction called No Strings Attached. So it's like friends with benefits kind of situations. And on top of these, just like 
ones that happen as we work through new books. We do periodically um, do uh, an overview of our collection to find holes and then create projects to really fill that gap. So then that way we can make sure we're hitting where we need to hit. So all in all, I had a lot of fun creating this new vocabulary and I loved um, working with the team that we had here. I think we all had a lot of fun. Everybody pitched in and different people led different areas. Um, so everybody's kind of got a baby in there somewhere. Um, if you have any questions or comments for me, feel free to reach out. I'll hand it over to you, Becky. Great, thanks Kathleen. So be thinking about questions for Kathleen um, and um, post them in our chat. And remember to chat to all participants. So Becky's going to focus on how as librarians, we can identify different sources for themes and put them to use with readers, um, put those themes and that knowledge into practice. So Becky. Hi, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, yes, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk to you about how to have the best conversations in your library and how to be the friendliest library you can in your town. And the way to do that is to talk about books. Talk about books you like and books you're reading and share among your entire staff with each other and with your patrons. And one of the things I realized, this is a talk I've given for many, many years, a different version of it. And when I was working with novelists to talk about themes, and uh, let me tell you, they've been working on these a long time because we've been talking about it They've been talking about it with me for at least a year, so I know it's been going on for a while. Um, I realized that themes were really the key to that. But we're going to start right away with the next slide, because I feel like this captures perfectly how all of you feel about books. Look, you work in a library because you have some kind of origin story that has to do with books. You may not work with books right now at the library, but hey, nobody goes to the library or goes to work at the library for the money. I know you're doing it because somewhere deep down you love books. And guess what? As we go to the next slide, I'm going to show how we can take that, how we feel about books, and really turn it into some power. There is so much power when you share a book. Think about how great you feel when you get to tell somebody about a book you love that you just read. Then think about how you feel when somebody tells you about a great book, and then you go read it, and you loved it, and then you pass it on. It is just, there's just so much power there. And some of that comes from that quote I have on there. And that quote is from the founder of Novelist, Duncan Smith. And that quote is, books are our brand, but reading is our business. And there is a quote, um, there is a link for that quote. Uh, if you quote, go through on the live slides, which will be available afterward um, to everyone who signed up to see where I got that from. But Duncan would say that a lot. And the idea is that people know we're about books, but reading is what we do. And if we really wanted to spend some time talking about it, which I'll only do for a second, reading goes into all the literacy we do, whether it's digital literacy or, or physical reading literacy. But the fact of the matter is, reading is what we're all about. And sharing that power, especially with our core business, our brand, um, sharing our core business with our core brand is wonderful. And you know what? You are a trusted expert. I need to remind everybody that people outside the library world think that every single person who works in the library is a librarian. They don't remember or know about all the rules and the things. And that's why when I talk about my business and when I give trainings, I say I'm teaching library workers how to serve leisure readers. Because everyone comes in and they expect information from every person who works in the library. Now, we need to train our staffs when to send people to the right desk, of course. But the thing is, everyone on staff is using your resources on their own too, because they're free. And most of them have unlimited checkouts and no fines. So of course, they're reading. And what I talk about, and we're going to do it today, is teach you how to share what you love to read with somebody. I'm going to talk about starting by sharing it coworker to coworker, and I'm going to talk to you about ways in which you can do it to make it easier, and we're going to really talk about how themes are a great way to get started with that. But the fact of the matter is that this is something everyone on staff can do, 
and it will give you that joy, and it will reconnect it to your job. And I'll have a couple of stories if there's time about ways that we've, I've used this training to reinvigorate staff who maybe weren't performing at their highest level because we told them they could share books they love. But I just want you to understand the themes. What I, I'm sure all of you had those moments when Kathleen was talking, like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. Fish out of water, you know, animals attacking, zombie apocalypses. Those are things that people talk about, not necessarily about a specific plot, but about the stories they're looking for. Now, let's get right to starting with all of you, though. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to do a very small little exercise here, and it's going to be really fun for you. And I'm going to tell you, you better do it because I'm going to use it a few slides later, too. You'll get more out of this if you do this. But it's not hard. Think of a book you love, any book. Look, one of the biggest problems I have when I say this to library workers is they think, oh, my gosh, I have to pick my all-time favorite book. If I say this is my favorite book, Becky's going to make me hold me to it. Everybody, all 600 people who are logged in are going to make me hold me to it. It's, it no, no, we're not. Just pick a book you like. It can be an all-time favorite. It can be a recent favorite. It can be the book you said was your favorite last year. Whatever. Just a book you really have strong feelings about. Now sit back right now, and it may, maybe you want to jot it down, but I want you to think about what happens in that book. Who does what to whom? Where do they go? Don't think about anything but actually what happens. You know, is it? A, do they go on a quest in the Wild West? Are there fighting? Is it, you know, a domestic suspense where there's lots of um, backstabbing and, and unreliable narrators? Like, what, what's happening? What's, what's the plot? What's going on? Okay, who did what to whom? Okay, now, now think about, now put that aside for a minute. Think about a couple other books that you were considering when I had number one and told you to think of a favorite book. I like that some people are sharing their favorite book. That's awesome. Keep doing that in the chat. That's really going to help other people. Um, now think about a few other books you really like. Just other books that maybe would have made that list. Other books that you possibly um, could have uh, listed here, an all-time favorite. Okay? We got those books? Now think about what happens in that book. Let's repeat. Let's do number two for that book, right? Okay. Now. Um, let's go to the next slide, because this is what I want you to do now. Every single one of you. Right now, I know I can't see you. Trust me. I know what's going to happen. Put your hand high in the air and wave it. If all those books you thought about, all those books you like, the exact same thing happens. Exactly. The exact same plot. I'm going to wait for a minute while you think about it. But I'm pretty sure I know the answer. If we can click the, to the next thing. The answer is no. Not a single one of the books. No one has ever read the exact same book, unless you're reading the exact same book as a reread. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and what I want to say to you here is that is the point, okay? That's plot. Plot is what happens in a book is very unique about a book. And that's great. What happens in the book is fine. But what happens in the book is not why you loved that book. Why you probably liked that book you picked as number one has a lot more to do with appeal, which are also a novelist. Things about the storyline, how fast-paced it is, what happens, are there plot twists, is it um, character-centered, are there flawed characters, is it dark, what is the tone? A lot of times the books you like, if you really sit down and think about the appeal of the books, they have a lot in common. And this is very common. So that's why you could see people liking different books that where different things happen, even across different genres, but they share appeals. But when we talk about theme, this is a little bit different. Theme isn't necessarily going to be the same for all your favorite books. Books. You may be a character reader. You know, we talk about those doorways. You may be a plot reader. And that's an appeal that's general. But you may be looking for a little something specific happening in your book. I think somebody mentioned in the chat, they mentioned space opera, right? That's a type of theme. All space operas are different, but they all sort of, they all sort of have the same kind of theme we can expect. Um, I call them, you know, Star Wars in space, you know, Star Wars, or I call them science fiction fantasy almost too. You know, we have all the, the, we're in space, but we have all the drama of life and politics and, and they feel a little bit more like a fantasy in a way. But anyway, that's for another time. The point is, themes are more natural because what we are trying to do at the library, the way Reader's Advisory has mm, sort of evolved. Yes, that's right. Space opera was a title and I actually have that on. Someone put it in the chat. 
on um, ready on audio to listen to any minute. Good point, though. Um, I one of the goals we have with Readers Advisory is different. It used to be about hey, let's get people to the desk. Let's have them tell us about a book they really like, and then let's match them to another title they like. Let's make it all about the transaction. And that's the way Readers Advisory was for a very long time. But now that we've sort of shown at most libraries that people know they can come in and tell us about the things they want to read and that we'll have some advice for them, we've made it very clear that we have displays. Hopefully, if we go through my training here a little bit, we'll be talking more about books so we can show them we do it. But the fact of the matter is we're past that transactional point. We're moving on to the conversations. We want to have those water cooler moments at the library where people are coming and sharing the books that they care about and the books that they've enjoyed with each other and not worried about if they're making a suggestion that the person they're telling it to wants to read it. We're more evolving to talking about books, to conversational versus transactional readers advisory. And themes are the way we get to this success. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about a mystery, for example. We have readers who come in and tell us they love mysteries. Mystery and romance we're going to talk about for just a quick second because those are our biggest readers. And you saw that on the, some of the slides that Kathleen had. You know, but mystery is so huge. What do they want? Well, themes are a way for us to get there. One of my favorite themes that I like on Novelist for Mysteries is Rookie on the Beat. That tells me so much more about the story than whether it's historical, uh, whether it's fast-paced even, or character-centered. Lots of mysteries are character-centered, some more than others. Um, it tells me what is really going on in that story. And romance is another great example, too. Romance readers are so good about talking about themes, and we're going to have an example of that in a few minutes. But is it a second chance at love or friends to love her story? This, when we talk about books in these grander themes, rather than saying, well, are you looking for a fast-paced book? Are you looking for a dark-toned book? Are you looking for a scary book? When we talk about the themes, those are words they know and already use. Yes, we have trained some of our patrons to be very good at um, talking in appeal terms, but most people are going to talk when these, in these themes. And I think you got a sense of that when Kathleen explained them. Um, so let's go to the next slide where I talk about how we can maybe talk about books differently. Now, for this slide, I want you to think about that book you picked as your favorite book that you thought about as I am talking. And when I talk about book talking in the stacks, I'm really talking about how you can quickly share a book you've really enjoyed. Now, good news is, after today, you're going to have a book you can do right away because I've made you think of it, and I'm going to have you walk through this, and you're going to have some ideas on how to share that book. And then every time you have a book you enjoy, I want you to keep this slide in mind. Um, again, there will be links to the slide sent out to all people who signed up, and you can look at this, print it out, use these step-by-steps as you think about talking about books. The first thing you need to do is look for opportunities to talk to people about the books that you've enjoyed. Again, without worrying if you're recommending them, suggesting them, just to share them. I suggest sharing at the desk first and foremost because with your coworkers, yes, I'm telling you, tell your bosses, Becky's telling you to talk about what you're reading at the desk. I even go so far as to say talk about what you're watching, what movies you've seen, anything you check out. But we're focused on books today. Look for opportunities. Also, talk to those patrons who come in regularly. Um, I also really like getting up and physically getting in the stacks and encountering people where they are to talk to them. The point is you have to have an opening line to start talking. You don't just walk up to somebody, grab their hand, and say, hey, I'm going to tell you about a book I love. That's creepy and weird, and you, can't, you need to be invited to have that conversation. Um, we're not invading people's space here. But we can say, hey, I always would say this out loud. I'd be walking around in the stacks or at the desk. If anybody wants to hear about some good books, come on by. We're always reading. Or I would say, oh, what are you looking for? And a lot of times people say, I'm no, I don't know. That's our number one answer. Well, here's my solution to that number one response we get when we try to engage readers. Say, well, hey, I have no idea what you like, but let me tell you about a book I've really enjoyed. And so then I start with a book I love and a sound bite. I'm going to use The Martian as an example because Kathleen had it up there, so it's already in your mind. So I have a sound bite for The Martian. Um, it's MacGyver on Mars. And that's a great way to get started getting people's interest. Right away, I can gauge if they're interested or not. But then I tell them a little bit about The Martian. Now I have some themes from novelists to use to talk about it, too. 
Um, if I talk about a book, I often want to make sure it's in before I talk about it. Um, so I sometimes walk people over to where it is. Um, so that is sometimes something you want to think about. But if you're just trying to talk, you could um, then say to them at the end, you know, well, what about you? And we can find you books similar to the one I talked about if it's not in. Don't give any plot. Don't tell them what happens. What happens is easy. You can go grab the book cover and let them read the summary that the publisher wrote for the basic plot points. And I found a lot of readers don't want to know what happens any anymore. So the key is to keep the book center stage. It's about the book. What was your experience with the book? Um, and it's a conversation back and forth about books. If you have a book you like and you go on to Novelist and there's themes there, that's great. But if not, I'm going to show you how to find theme ideas on Goodreads in a minute, too. But it's about the conversation about the books. So you say to them, well, that's the book I liked. What about you? Tell me about a book you like. I have had such better responses when I am conversational about a book. Tell them what I liked about it and not necessarily what happened. But, you know, those those themes of things that are really were the reason that I was drawn to it or the reason I remember that book. Um, I think Jaws is also a great example. You know, Crazy Animals. I like lots of books like that, too, Animals Gone Wild, but not only just sharks. If we use just the subject headings, we're only going to get shark books. It's about more than that. Um, it's a conversation. And you're going to have your own style that's going to work for you. The key is to just be enthusiastic about your title that you're sharing. And then hopefully it will rub off on them. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, a few more beginner tips. When you start small, and then we're going to move on to some examples. Um, start small. All the books that you're reading and enjoying. And then your next step might be moving on to books you've heard about. Books that you're hearing, like when you talk to a staff member about books, then they tell you, and you're like, wow, so-and-so on staff, Susie really likes this book. She's not here right now, but here's what I remember that she told me. Um, you should be talking about staff favorites, yours and your coworkers, things you're hearing about, patron favorites, things patrons have told you. You can share anything. The thing is the thing, especially when we open ourselves up to using things like themes, you can actually use the words of others. And I have a whole post about that. Again, you'll get a live link of these slides when um, the, the supplemental material comes out in the next day or so. But you can use the words of others to book talk. You can say, so-and-so said this about it, or this review said this about it. And Novelist and Goodreads are my two favorite places to find that. And again, we're about to get into some examples in just a minute. Um, but really, again, Think about yourself, and I hope that you did that when I was talking through that one quick slide, and how you talk about the books you like, and how you find new titles. Where do you find your books to read? Maybe you want to talk about the resources you use to find good books with someone. Um, that's all ways to get the conversation about books going, rather than just trying to be transactional. But now I am going to put themes in action for you on the next slide. We're going to talk right now for the last uh, five, ten minutes or so about real-life reader's advisory queries that I got. Um, we're going to talk about tutors versus novels of place. We're going to talk about romance, which I already sort of um, foreshadowed. And we're going to talk about um, end of a world, which is not a genre, and how themes work. I'm going to have um, very specific screenshots about how to use Novelist and Goodreads to get to this and how some things are better than others. And then at the very end, after the webinar is over, if people want to stay on, we will have some more specific searches led by Kathy. So let's go to our very next slide and get started right away. Um, so my light bulb moment for why themes work happened um, with this idea of novels of place. So I said at the slide before that we want to talk about tutors versus novels of place. The tutors are my example I use of a frame, a specific setting that we all have very many readers that you probably have readers like this at your library. And it might not be the tutors, but this is a good example where they want to read every single thing set in the tutor time period. And I had a lady who would read fiction, nonfiction, graphic novels. I don't know if we ever found her one, but literally audiobooks, movies. If it was tutors, she'd read it. Okay, and that's somebody who's really reading for appeal, the appeal of a specific frame. She's really excited about that. Novels of Place is a little different. Let me talk to you about a book that I really had this light bulb moment on, The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich. If we could click one more time to see that novelist screenshot, great. Here's a very the shortened and blown up a little bit of The Roundhouse screenshot. Um, I want you to look at this. The genre is literary fiction, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about right now. Literary fiction is a little bit harder for themes. Now, part of the thing is a lot of literary fiction shares a lot of the same appeals. I happen to like literary fiction because 
um, and let's look at some of these appeals, that they are generally have complex characters, and they are very often culturally diverse. I like that. Um, I also like that they are a little bit darker in tone, but they're also reflective. They're very thought-provoking, that they're driven by character. My doorway is character. And that they have really interesting language. These are things that drive together a lot of literary fiction. It doesn't necessarily keep them all apart. Most literary fiction share these appeals. Here's the thing. I don't like every single literary fiction. I really liked this book, though. This is a book I read when it came out. It stayed with me. I have hand-sold this book to thousands of readers. Why? Why did it? And then when novelists added um, novels of place, I had a light bulb moment. Because I would then click and ran a search with um, the novels of place to see what else come up. And just to give you a quick sense, I'm going to throw out some titles, but you can do the search yourself or if you can ask um, somebody else can maybe put the titles in later. But Sing Unburied Sing, actually it was by Jessamyn Ward, I can say that. The White Tiger, which is a book set in India. Um, a few, whole bunch of novels by Ron Rash. Those came up right at the top when I clicked on novels of place as a theme. And I went, oh my gosh, those are all books I really liked. They're all centered very deeply around a place, a place that I don't know very well. And I was like, whoa, that's why I like them. There is it, those books coming together. I tried to recreate getting those books to all come up like that a different way, um, using uh, other things other than theme. It didn't work. And that's because um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work with appeal. It only works with theme. Now, if we can click again, I'm going to go back to the screen. I'm going to clear it. And then we're going to click one more time to bring up Goodreads because it got too busy when they were all there. Now, Goodreads does something like themes that they have for years. And I'm going to show you how it gets better as we move into genre. But something called shelves. And this is where readers put their sort of idea of what is the theme up there. Um, and here you can see we get things like friendship, which was mentioned, and abandoned, and a few other things. Um, Native American lit, which isn't really a theme. Um, it's more of a frame. And so it's not as good in Goodreads, but you can see readers trying to grasp at that, trying to find a way to articulate the things that aren't in what the book's about on those shelves. But now let's move to a genre that I'm less um, a fan of, if we can click, and go talk about romance, because there the readers really do have a sense of how to talk about books. Um, the language of themes is perfect for all genre readers, but specifically romance readers, because they really understand their personal preferences. There's so much romance, and readers are so passionate about romance that they needed a way to talk about it beforehand. So we're going to talk about how subgenre and appeal and theme work in, in tandem with romance. If we could click through, our example is Wrong to Need You by Alicia Rye, which is a book I have read. Um, and here we have a, the genre's contemporary romance. But it's really those themes of childhood sweethearts and enemies to lovers that get to why we really want to read this book, why people really enjoyed this book. Um, on, now, in, in the case of romance, we do care about the appeal a lot in terms of the tone, um, how hot and steamy it is, and that is a consideration. But if we click through again to look at Goodreads, we can start to see, and one more time to clear it, I didn't want it to be busy for you. There we go. We start to see those same terms coming up. We see friends to lovers. Um, we see, um, I forget what they, we see Stevie too. Um, we see those other things coming up on there, second chance romance, that readers were already doing on their own. And they're in novelist. And this is captured by the way readers talk. I'm trying to show you this is how readers talk. So even if you don't have novelists, Goodreads is the place you want to go to see how readers talk. And one last example before we finish up and get to some more searching and stuff, I want to talk on the next slide about how we can use themes to help people when we're not talking about a genre, when we're talking about something that crosses genre, end of a world. It can be an apocalypse, right? But look at all the different ways we could have an apocalypse. Kathleen wouldn't like a zombie one, necessarily. Um, but there's lots of, lots of different ways, and it isn't in one genre. Themes are really helpful here, and let me show you why. This is a question I have gotten multiple times, and I know you have too. I like The Walking Dead TV show, but I really don't like zombies or horror. What should I read next? Let's click through. Let's look at the novelist entry for The Walking Dead. Um, look at what we see here. Here's something that really gets at that idea of these stories that are about an end of a world and how it, it, the end of the world, by the way, stories are filled with so much hope 
And people don't think about that, but there is, because these people are bands of survivors. Now, we do have zombie apocalypse as a theme there, but we also have band of survivors. And here's the thing. When we use band of survivors as a theme, we can actually help more readers. Because let me show you that reader who doesn't like zombies or horror. Let's click through. If we use band of survivors as a theme to search a novelist, here's a YA dystopian science fiction um, shipbreaker. This is clearly... Um, about bands of survivors. And um, all these books by the way they're showing up, I have read and loved for this theme myself. And I do like zombies. Let's click again. We can get another book that's a literary fiction for adults that's won many awards, Station Eleven, which is also about a band of survivors. By the way, as they went through, they all had different reasons the world was ending. Um, the zombie apocalypse was in the first one. We had a cli-fi situation, climate apocalypse, in the next one. And that was there in the um, themes. And then here we have a pandemic apocalypse. Three completely different reasons for apocalypses. Three completely different genres. One band of survivors. I really feel like that gets to why themes work and how we can use them. Now let's just quickly go to practice, uh, the next slide about practicing. And while I finish up on this very last slide, um, the idea here is I know this was really fast and I do have a full hour long training on how to book talk. But when we practice, when we create more opportunities, for us to book talk with each other, that advertising our, advertises our willingness to do it, and it also gives us practice. I also say um, that you can use or that you can uh, get your regular patrons to come in too. Sometimes I give a regular patron a book and I say, hey, go read this and come back and give me a book talk. I'm always telling you about books. You tell me about it. I can't read everything. Um, so then you can set, uh, you can use resources like Novelist and Goodreads to Find talking points also, and themes are a great way to do that, especially for a book you haven't read. You can actually pull up those screenshots like I showed you. Those um, For Goodreads, it's, you go to the book's record, and it's like you know shelves, popular shelves, and then it hits find all shelves. Those are just all terms readers have used to talk about books. Same thing by using the themes. I also have a longer post, which we'll not go into now, on how you can actually create a friendly competition among your staff to get better at book talking. Again, you will have the live slides with links, and it'll show you how to do that very step by step. But the idea I want to remind you is, this is fun. You're being paid to talk about books. I hope, and I, I'm going to hazard a bet that most of you were excited when I told you to think about a favorite book today, but you didn't think you were going to be allowed to think about something you loved today, and that you got to think about how you would share it when I went through all those different tips. That is so fantastic for you to give you that energy to keep serving readers. And that is the end of my presentation. The slides will be on RA for All tomorrow, and they'll go out with novelists. They do have a copy of my live slides for everyone um, that you can then use to link to find more information. Oh, thanks, Becky. It really is fun to talk about books. We are all so lucky that we get to do that regularly. So while you all are thinking about questions that you might have, um, I actually have a couple for our panelists. So I thought I would start with Kathleen. And um, Kathleen, I just wondered if you could just share with us a little bit about um, future themes work at Novelist. Kind of what's on tap, what's coming next, and tell us a little bit about the process that you guys use for um, identifying what work to do next. Well, that's a great question. Um, one of the things we have at um, Novelist is you know, all the different types of vocabularies that we have. And we touched on all the different ones of the genre, appeal, um, theme, and just regular subject headings. What we do is we have a council of librarians, kind of like the Jedi High Council-ish, <laughs> kind of. And basically what we do is kind of look at what projects we could create. Where do we need to go? What, ma what makes the best um, uh, idea for us to go? Because a lot of these headings are so closely related. Um, and I know I saw through the comments that nonfiction themes was um, a big ask. Believe me, yeah. that is on the table to be um, suggested for management. We also have other ones. Um, histor historical fiction is another area where we would like to give it a, a better, more thorough um, push through. We did look at any um, subgenres that were historically based, so like historic romances um, and things like that, we did look at, but we didn't look at historical fiction as a large genre itself. Um, I definitely would like to go back um, and 
do any cleanup work we can on the younger on the levels, like for picture books and things. I'm sure there's some that we missed. Uh, and I know we have a project on the table for graphic novels Ooh, um, because that, that is a little bit different. Um, we did make themes for superhero stories, um, but those are print. And so these would be for actual graphic novels. Oh, excellent. So just as a follow-up, um, I think uh, I was wondering too, because I'm a children's librarian, um, just um, what you do if you get suggestions maybe from conversations, like for folks who are listening today, if they're having conversations with younger readers or with teens, or even um, folks who work with adults, if they have suggestions for, as they're talking with people and having these great conversations about books, um, what do you recommend? Can folks, um, would you be comfortable with them emailing you with suggestions? Oh, yeah, or? they can email me directly or you can send feedback. That's also pretty easy because you can just click the feedback on the novel page. Um, either way, we are so happy to have a conversation. Anybody who wants to talk metadata, we love to talk about. Excellent. Um, so, so, yeah. so you heard it here, everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you have ideas or suggestions, um, that would be great. And um, I've got a question for... Um, for Becky, actually, um, so we had a question come in through chat. Um, do you have any recommendations, Becky, as to how librarians might consider um, when they're talking and working with book clubs, um, maybe incorporating talk or, or mention of themes in those conversations with folks who are doing book clubs or even as part of the book club discussion themselves? Do you have any thoughts about that? I actually do, and it's funny because I just did a new series of lists for novelists um, that I'm working on, um, and they're available in the book club section um, that are sort of theme-based lists, and I made them a little more updated and inclusive. Um, so I did themes like Off the Radar Gems, and I had something like um, uplifting books that you know that you could still talk about. I had all these more book club ready themes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there is what we can do when we're talking with book groups is yes, I think that themes are a great way to get at a wide variety of books because in those lists I sort of came up with my own ideas. They weren't themes that novelists used, but ideas of of what you would maybe call a theme for a book group list that could go together. They were lists of six books that were in completely different genres, but um, worked really well for a book club. And I think that's really a great way to maybe put your collections together. When I led a book club for 15 years, I know that my group really appreciated when some of the books serendipi serendipitously um, could be discussed together, but a theme is a great way to find a way to link maybe three or six books you're doing in a row, and something like Novels of Place or Bands of Survivors, something that goes across genres, is a great way to do that. The friendship one is an excellent idea also. Um, so, you know, the themes that involve with friendship, as opposed to just being about friends, and it's a way you could then sort of start your discussion every time and say things like, right. You know, these books, this is our theme we're doing. How does this book fit this theme? It also gives people a way to read for something. My favorite one I did for Novelist was Upbeat Books, and I wrote a little, or Happy Books for Book Clubs. I wrote something to the effect uh -huh. of, like, you don't have to be curled up in a pile of, like, goo crying in order for it to be a discussable <laughs> book. And these are books where serious things happen, but they're still discussable. And I think that is a great theme to do. But I think if you, you don't necessarily have to use the themes that Novelist has. Maybe find sort of a theme that your group is interested in, a sort of general idea, and then work together to find books that fit that, and then use that as your jumping off point. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that's a great, great suggestions. And do you think that might carry over? There was a um, comment in the chat about maybe extending that into um, uh, possibly finding, you know, commonalities um, leading to maybe someone finding an author, a different author with a similar writing or prose style or themes. Do you think themes can still be kind of a unifier? I think themes can be a unifier because um, I think that, first of all, I think people are more willing to try different books if there's something in it that they can attach to, right? So it's the way we sell the book to people. So if we're selling it on, hey, you liked the roundhouse, and um, we discussed that you liked how it was, you know, use me as an example, in a place that you don't know a lot about, um, you might like the white tiger set in India. That is that a place you know a lot about? And they'll say, no. I say, well, here is. And then we can do a little more comparison on the appeal, the writing style, and those kind of things to maybe sell it to them. But often just what, whatever that one thing is, 
that will give them a chance to give it a try. Um, and I think people will start to find connections between mm-hmm. books and authors and unify them on their own um, in ways that are meaningful to them without our interference of trying to help them do that in, in a way that sort of liberates the entire reader's advisory, again, going from trans, the transactional relationship to conversational. Um, I think it just allows us to speak their language, our reader's language. Um, and, and honestly, and I tried to capture that in my talk, it allows us to recapture our language of why we love books and not the way we have to talk about them for work. And everybody is a little more free and open to pick any book in the case, in that case. Well, I love that idea of um, just using all that data and all those access points as connectors. Um, okay, so we've gotten lots of questions. Thank you for the questions. Please keep them coming. We've got more time. Can I, can I address one I saw in the, in the chat? It was about rural libraries and small libraries. Oh, absolutely. Yes, please. Okay, because I really do work with a lot of small rural libraries. I travel to a lot to these more remote areas, and then libraries um, pool their money and their, and their time and everything, and they get a whole bunch of different libraries to come so they can train together. And so I really understand what small and rural libraries are going through. And I think themes are going to help you so much more because you, I, I, I'm at – Sorry to all you big city library people, but those rural spa libraries, that's where the best conversations are happening because their patrons are coming in and talking about books, and the relationship between the patrons and the, the library workers is a, is a lot closer because for many people, this is like where they come for all their leisure and entertainment options. So they're more willing to have those open conversations. And I think themes are a great way for you to, you know, you go on Goodreads or Novelist and find a theme about a book that's popular. Or someone tells you about a book they're reading and you're like, gosh, that's some weird subgenre of romance and I don't read that, but I'm going to go look on, on Goodreads and Novelist and see what those words, those themes are, especially those shelves that readers are putting them on on Goodreads, and be like, oh, now I'm getting a sense of what this book's about. Let's talk about it. It's just a way to have more connections. Um, It's a way for your patrons to let you know what they like because your budget is a lot more strained. And so maybe you can make choices not necessarily based on, you know, this author, one of their books they really loved, but the next four they didn't. Why is that? You may be able to see better that maybe the themes have changed. You know, one of the reasons I say Jody Peacoat does so well at libraries is she's got that same theme. I I, I don't know if you guys have used this one because I haven't dug into all 250 but I call it families. Oh, you with haven't? Uh, not all 250. I've read a lot of them. But families with issues. That's what I say for Jody Pico. That's how I describe her. I don't talk about her with a genre. She's the queen of families with issues. And as long as she keeps writing about families with issues, people will read her books because they know that that's what they're going to get. Um, if, if she changed her themes, I bet we'd see a difference in people. Now, maybe people would still like her, but it might not be the same people. It's just a great way for you to kind of hone down with a limited budget what your readers really are enjoying. Thank you. Thank you. These are all really, this is fascinating, really, to think about, again, just taking the components and thinking about how that can help our readers. Um, so another question for Kathleen. There was a question that came in, Kathleen, about whether um, – when you were talking about um, doing more work with themes, whether or not that will include with graphic novels, if it will include manga. Oh, my gosh, it will. Um, it will include any type of material that will be considered, you know, graphic novel, comics, really anything in that huge area. We've got a pretty passionate group of people that are very into this idea, very excited. Um, uh, so that's uh, they're going to really hit everything and really look at it as like both like an individual and the kind of a global level. So one more data-oriented mm-hmm. question. Um, we had a, a question in chat. Um, appeal versus theme. For some books, what's really the difference? Um, well, this would be one of my um, favorite themes. Uh, <laughs> and actually favorite appeal terms. Uh, the one I'm thinking about is gruesome. You know, for that's when it's like, whoa, that's a lot of blood. Um, you is related to the one called body horror, which um, you might. Um, this is something about where your body is doing something very um, unusual, very almost horrific. Think of it like childbirth or being pregnant. It's kind of like that. Um, I like to think of David Cronenberg uh, movies. Um, <laughs> So that's how I see it. And both of them about your body doing weird things 
and gruesome, they really, they're totally two different things. So the gruesome could be like, ooh, that was an unfortunate thing I saw as a police officer, and that's pretty gruesome the way they're describing it, versus body horror, which is, yeah, that's the body. So it's interesting because, you know, as, as readers, we can all take all these bits of information and really start to synthesize it and connect the dots. Um, so I've got a question for both of you. Um, so thinking about um, themes um, and just a starting, you know, kind of starting points for readers, um, could each of you address what you think might be a particular theme that would appeal to a whole lot of people? So if um, we've got some librarians out there who are either working like with a book club or just conversation starters in general, what do you guys think would be some, you know, some themes you could kind of hang your hat on in terms of maybe ones to start with? You can go first, Kathleen. Um, I really think um, unlikely friendship is really one of my favorite go-to when um, trying to help people because a lot of times, um, you know, you can think of, people can think of television shows where it's like, um, you know, odd couples, basically. And I think you see those a lot in fiction. Those are always, I think, an uplifting thing to read. I think it goes well. And everybody can kind of identify that. It's, it's, that's usually one of my favorite go-tos in that situation. How about you, Becky? Yeah, sure. I like the, um, and, and it's one that I think crosses genre, too, although it's, it's mostly applied to fantasy in novelists, but the chosen one, these idea of these people oh, that are right. destined for greatness, I just see so many readers who like those stories, um, and they're ones that just capture people, especially if they're like going on vacation or something, because we know that it's somebody who we can get behind and root for and really, um, really be behind them for that story and hold on to it. It's a good place for me to start when I'm talking to people, um, especially people who uh, identify that they like character. Um, I think it, and this kind of goes with the question and, and, and a little bit with the last question, um, you know, some people will be more drawn to theme and some people will be draw, more drawn to appeal. So mm, if yeah. people are very specific that they want, like, I want a scary book or I want a plot-driven book, then maybe theme isn't the where you start with them, too, right? We have to go with the flow of what our readers bring to us. Um, and I definitely have my share of readers who are 100% like, I need a book that, you know, this is a really good example. I, my library was near a hospital, so it's like I have, you know, a family member going in for a full day of medical testing or a short hospital stay. I need something that I can just, will keep my attention and keep me going and turning the pages for eight hours. And in that case, I'm not really going to go with themes. We're going to really start talking about, well, what, you know, genres do you like? And let's find you something fast-paced. But for people who are more looking for that, you know, general overall um, feel of a book, that really works um, very, very well. Oh, you know another one I really like, and I think if you stick around, we're going to do that, um, is that Inspired by Real Events. I know we're going to do right. a search with that, but that's, right. I love that because, you know, it's not nonfiction necessarily, although it might, that will include nonfiction, but it's also, you know, it's not necessarily um, a biography, but it's, it could be a story that's inspired by something that actually happened um, I, you know, and it's great for books like Amityville Horror, which is a classic that people don't, some libraries have in fiction and some people have it in nonfiction. And there's a lot of issues now about the, the creation of that story in the family. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, about it, but it's inspired by real events. Whether or not it's true or not doesn't really matter. It's inspired by real events. And that's one that a lot of people, too, will come to. Right. So... As Becky um, alluded to, based on feedback that we've received from prior webinars, we're going to do something a little different today. We're about um, out of time for the actual um, webinar itself. So what we thought we'd do is give anybody who needs to leave, oh, sorry if you're leaving, but if you need to leave, um, uh, just wanted to let you know that, of course, we will be um, posting the recording of this session and also all the materials that we'll refer to today, plus a few others so that you'll have those as reference. So please know that you will have access to those materials. But we thought we'd just um, spend a few moments just showing you a little bit about um, where to find themes and novelists and a little bit about some of the um, specific terms that might help you in some of the things that you do every day. And there was also a question in chat about whether or not themes will be added to the appeal mixer 
Well, we've actually made that happen in one of our products, Novelist Select, and we'll show you that too. So give us a moment to um, switch gears a little bit. And folks who need to leave, um, we will miss you and we're glad that you joined us. And we are recording again, and we'll also record this part of the session too so that you can have access to that as well. And again, as Becky mentioned, um, of course, um, since we're, we're novel novelist folks here, we're going to show you a few tips and tricks in novelist. But Becky mentioned, and you'll see um, in the materials that we'll be, uh, excuse me, posting tomorrow, try saying that quickly three times, um, you'll see the different sources that Becky mentioned from some of her blog posts to um, things, uh, techniques that you can use in Goodreads to get back and just start thinking a little bit about, about themes and where to get some information about that. So I thought that I might show you just a few things and kind of um, bear with me a little bit of basic things, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't take anything for granted here. So first of all, um, you might want to know where you actually find a list of themes in novelists. And you find that here. If you click here, into this um, question mark that's located by the search bar. You type in themes, and this is really true actually of anything that you're searching in Novelist. You'll see that you get a nice little um, result page here which shows you the things that we were referencing today from all of the story elements, appeal terms and such, and then the theme terms themselves. So when we were talking about um, starting points for conversations with your patrons, this, you know, this might be somewhere to start, just to kind of take a little peek and let them ponder a little bit and just go through some of these and see if there are any that immediately jump out or resonate with them. So these are really fun, and I, 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 I caution you, this is a little bit addictive when you start to go through these um, themes. You'll, you'll laugh, you'll cry, <laughs> you'll want to jump in and do some searches yourselves, but again, um, Oh, someone in the chat says drooling. Yes, kind of like Pinterest. Yes, yes. So um, please come and feel free to uh, ponder, peruse, and then share out um, as you would like to. And use those, again, as a nice starting point to have some conversations with folks. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, I'm putting in a book that I'm reading for um, a book club this weekend, actually. Um, I'm Kathy Stewart, if you know me, don't tell anybody I haven't read it yet. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to tell you is um, when you click into books, I wanted to show you where you might find that information. So if you're a novelist uh, power user, you'll remember that the genres, um, character headings, all the different appeal terms and subject headings are here in the book record. And so notice themes is right there with those because it's part of those story elements that we've been talking about. So that's where you find them. And I just wanted you to make sure that you know where to find them in Novelist. And then also, um, I know Becky and Kathleen both were talking about really thinking about and tuning into which themes might be something that you might want to use as a jumping off point. So as I scroll down, um, just remember that under that search for more section here at the bottom, you'll see that theme facing racism has a little ticky box beside it. So if you had folks who really only wanted to focus in on just that aspect as a, a jumping off point for maybe another book they'd like to look for, they can do that very easily because of the way that we've broken up the, the metadata in Novelist. And then I also want to show you that um, You'll see with a book like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, just along with the fact that, um, you know, books can have a, a variety of different kinds of headings applied to them, same is true with themes. You'll see that there are plenty of themes associated with Harry Potter, and that probably doesn't surprise anybody listening because that book has a lot going on. So if you've got um, maybe different aspects here that might be of interest to your reader, just know that often you'll see that more than one theme can get added to a book too. Yes, and someone mentioned hidden heritage sounds promising. Yes, yes it does. 
So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that there could be more than one theme assigned, and I think that's um, definitely a plus. But as Kathleen mentioned, we would really love to hear your feedback. And I'm here on the main screen, and the place where you can provide feedback, we'd love to hear what you think about themes or ideas for other ones. And now you know that Kathleen is um, anxiously awaiting to hear from you. I know that you'll be rushing to the feedback link to send her some, some feedback. So that's how you do it, is from here. So I wanted to show you, too, how themes can really help you in your work. Um, I'm currently binging on the Americans. I don't know if anybody else um, really uh, was interested or is watching it, but um, I, I'm, I'm hooked. And um, I noticed that we have a theme behind the Iron Curtain. And so you'll notice that I put in a two-letter code here. Those are field codes, and they are definitely your friend in Novelist. Um, and you'll note if you use Novelist regularly for um, appeals, that um, AP is the two-letter field code that has to do with appeals. Well, the one for themes, as you can imagine, it's pretty easy to remember, it's TH. Um, and we just had a question, by the way, uh, will themes work in K-8? Yes, they will, but they will only show um, themes for uh, younger kids and teens, but not adults. So when I search this, the reason I thought of this um, right this red hot second is that if you have somebody who is binge watching a particular show and you wanted to really tune into that aspect um, of a show and maybe make it something that you could um, kind of finagle and use as fodder for book display, seems to make a great thing to use for book display. So you'll see that we got more than 100 results. If you wanted to refine that further, maybe sort by newer books or maybe choose um, a particular pace, um, you could just really take those limiters and just kind of go to town and really think about how else you might want to um, parse out those results that you got. So I just wanted to show you that. And then Becky mentioned um, the theme that we have that's um, inspired by real events. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Kathleen, this was one that was really popular with the metadata librarians because they know how hard this is to find this kind right. of information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they were super excited to be able to give you um, more access points so that you could really think about and find books because we know patrons really, really um, like to read uh, books that were inspired by real mm -hmm. events. Um, and we just had a question about where we can find a list of those two-letter codes. We've got a huge team here at Novelist, and Liz Holscomb, who's on today, um, puts together a lot of our documentation. And if you go up to that um, How Do I link in the top bar of Novelist, and then scroll down to Learn How to Use Novelist, you'll find that there is a huge variety of materials in there. Um, including a list of field, field codes. There's both an advanced list and then kind of a super short cheater pants sheet. So um, you'll have your pick of ones that would be most helpful to you. Thanks for that. that. That's a really great question. I should have mentioned that. So thank you for that. Um, so something else I wanted to tell you is that um, just like with all the metadata in Novelist, it really lends itself to combining with other things. So if you wanted to think about using a theme, um, and I'm thinking of one because of something that, um, that Kathleen mentioned, um, friendship. Um, I'm first going to do this one. We used to be friends. Because Kathleen talked earlier, and Becky too, about the fact that subject headings are really fabulous. But you know what? They just don't always um, get the job done. And if I uh, search for um, maybe books for the younger set, because um, really friendship's a really big deal for kids. Um, this kind of gets more at uh, friendships that went away for whatever reason. So again, friendships are really a fabulous subject heading, but um, used to be friends just takes it down and gives it a little bit more nuance. So I'm just going to show you one more, too. And again, um, I'm a children's librarian, so my, my, um, my brain kind of goes in that direction. But another theme that's great for younger kids is overcoming fear. 
But the thing that you can do, and we were talking about those two-letter codes called field codes, um, you can combine it with some of those other terms like upbeat. And that way, you can get instances of um, titles in which um, kids did something. Oh, and I forgot to clear my limiters. That should be a cautionary tale to you, to always clear your limiters. Um, so I'm going to go back and do that. And I think that just illustrates the point, though, for you, that you can really easily combine themes with other appeal terms um, with great success and really, again, get at some of those nuances that your readers are really interested in. So I really wanted to use this. It's, my, it's one of my favorite books. <laughs> so I'm determined to show you this. But under um, recommendations, review, and more, um, you'll see uh, an instance of our uh, novel Select, which has been uh, recently redesigned. And we sure hope you like it. We'd love to hear your feedback about it. We really wanted to put um, all of the read-alike information kind of um, lined up here and also super visual so that um, you can really think about finding those read-alikes and get that, that language as to why a read alike is being recommended in there. But um, the question was about story elements. So you'll see that the very next um, part, the next section, the next card here is called story elements. So um, if I were a reader and I were coming to this and thinking about, ooh, what do I want to read? I want to read something that's intricately plotted and maybe something that's a mystery and something that's um, introspective. You'll notice when I click on those, um, I get this really nice uh, search result. So this is something that we really love. It's very interactive and your patrons can really have fun with this. And I don't know if you noticed, but when I hover over each of those terms, whether or not it's a theme term or appeals, or character or genre, there's an explanation of that term so that your readers don't have to wonder what it means and make sure that they're, it's really matching them with the thing that they're most interested in. So um, this is our, our product that puts novelist uh, read-alikes into your catalog. And you'll see that this carousel is fabulous because folks can just scroll through and be taken to books that met that criteria having that theme data, and any other of those story elements that might be of interest to them. So we just had a question about what is Novelist Select. It's one of our um, suite of products, and basically it's designed to really make sure that any patron or reader who first comes to your library's catalog to find read-alikes or find their, their quest for that next great book they might want to read has all of that rich reader-focused metadata put right in the catalog for them so they don't have to go anywhere else. And what's great about um, um, information for your readers, what's great about you as librarians is that it really keeps those readers in your catalog because it gives them this information and it lets them uh, get that reader-focused information and then actually click through and get those titles in your library's catalog, and then hopefully go check those out. So those are some, th these are things that, um, that we feel really strongly about, bringing that reader-focused information and making sure that um, it takes readers to where they can get that book in your library and then where they can get that reader-focused information. Um, and most importantly, with novelists, get our metadata librarian, our contributors, our content librarians, all of our data and our professional sources as to why these series, these authors, and these titles are being recommended. Can I, can I butt in about using this helping readers? Sure. So I work in a system and live in a system. We're in the Swan system outside Chicago, and we have this product in our catalog. And I can't tell you how useful it is to help readers when they're at your catalog, they're logged in, they're looking at their stuff. You can actually go into their, with them in their records and 
if they're logged in looking at it and say, hey, you just checked this book out. That's the book you're returning. Let's go see. And I use Novelist with them in conversation right from their record, and they love it. They don't have to go anywhere. They can literally find their next book. They can place it on hold. And then they start to do it from home. And I found when they were doing it from home on their own, after I showed them how to do it, um, they would come in and tell me, hey, I got this book by using that stuff in the catalog. And then they'd want to share it with me. It's a really great way to keep those conversations going. Yeah, that's a really great point, too, Becky, about um, I know as a librarian, um, luckily I had plenty of patrons who enjoyed having conversations, but um, there are a lot of folks who maybe nece you know, don't necessarily like to come up and initiate a conversation. So um, it's a nice way you're really taking care of patrons um, who find their information different ways and have a starting point. Um, as the catalog, maybe instead of the website or maybe instead of asking someone, but you've really got a way to really um, to um, hook them up with information that will get them started and get them able to find a good book. So unless we have other questions, we just want to give you a little bit of a taste of um, specifically where to find themes in Novelist, um, a couple of ideas on using combinations um, for um, using those different parts of the story element um, in a way that we hope is useful to you, and then showing you how um, that, uh, that story mixer idea can really um, correlate and make your, your, uh, your catalog pretty powerful. So um, we hope that you enjoyed this and found it useful. We're always happy to hear feedback, as I mentioned, and please do feel free to um, to come back to Novelist and uh, check our website to get other tips on other ways that you can use some of that data within Novelist. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for your time.